I was one of the Native American children, adopted at birth and removed from our country's Indian reservation system. I was raised in a small middle-class farming community, but was never told of my true American Indian heritage. It was still taboo back in those early days. The years passed, and in 1987, I lost both parents. While going through their personal belongings, my wife discovered my adoption papers and she began a search. Five years later, I was reunited with my biological Lakota family living on the Lower Brule Sioux Indian Reservation of South Dakota. I am a son of two mothers and a product of two worlds that had collided. But I have an equal amount of love and pride for both. I'm Paul LaRush, and the stories you are about to see are an attempt to share this true American story of a hidden heritage. Thank you for joining us this week on Hidden Heritage. When we think of the art of the Lakota, well, there's one place in the world, here in the United States, in Western South Dakota, that showcases the art of the Lakota like none other. Join us now as we visit the special place called Prairie Edge and take a look at the art of the Lakota. Ray and Rita Hillenbrand established the current Prairie Edge concept in the early 1980s. The concept has two primary purposes. The first is to educate the public about and to preserve the heritage and culture of the Northern Plains Indians. The second purpose is to provide Northern Plains Indians artists and craftspeople an outlet at a fair price to them for their finest work which reflects on the heritage and culture. Prairie Edge is housed in a restored National Historic Registered Building originally built in the 1800s, thus giving appropriate respect for the housing of Northern Plains Indian artwork and craftwork. Today, both regional and nationally acclaimed artists show their work at Prairie Edge. Bead workers, quill workers, painters, photographers, musicians, potters, and silversmiths' artwork is featured in the Prairie Edge galleries in Rapid City, South Dakota. One of my friends from high school um, kind of got started in it back in the late 70s after high school. And, uh, you know, it was at that point in time, it was create some art and then go door to door and try to try to find someone to buy it. And um, then when Ray Hillenbrand came in, uh, he had the, the financial ability to kind of to, to back it up. Really went out and started to find artists that could contribute in a big way that had the quality of, of artwork that Ray really wanted to see. He had a, just an immediate love for the Lakota people and Native people. And, and that's, you know, he just invested in it. You know, it was back in those days, it was way too much of a Tijuana kind of mentality where people would just wait for uh, Native artists to really hurt for money and then they would just buy the artwork at a fraction of the price and it, it literally it just made him sick that that, that was going on and uh, there at that point in time there really wasn't a facility that specialized in this area and in, in really good quality Native American artwork and that was really where his and his wife Rita's dream started was to to create a facility that that really treated the people fair and, and put the artwork out there and promoted the, the artwork of, you know, primary Lakota people, but really just people of the, of the Northern Plains. You know, Santa Fe has their market pretty well established, but there really wasn't anything, especially at that time, that was geared really to promote the artwork of the people of the Northern Plains. And, and that's kind of where Prairie Edge really has its roots. Well, we have a really unique venue. You know, we have three-story building, and it's from 1886. So we're kind of right out the gate. We're in that era. We always say if there wasn't anything in this building, it would still be worth coming to see. But, you know, our, our relationship with, with so many of our artists are from day one. We have folks that, that we buy their artwork that we bought from 30 years ago when, when things really got started. And the really cool part of, of it is, or one of the really cool things is, in some cases, we're on third generation now of artists. We started with the with the fathers and the mothers and their children got into the trade, found out they could make a living at it. Now they're passing that on to their kids. And, you know, that's probably will end up being the greatest legacy of, of Prairie Edge is to just establish that generational art form, which is, it's just fantastic. Those folks, 
February in South Dakota can be a tough time, and those propane tanks are running low. And believe me, they're not. The folks aren't trying to move up from from you know the the Subaru to the Escalade or the the Humvee. That's not what the folks are trying to do. They're just really trying to find an outlet to to sell that and. You know, I can't blame the folks that are in the seasonal business for not being able to purchase. But that's just, a, you know, there's really a two real separate things. There are people and great Native artists that that do really well making a living at this. But there is a, a far bigger percentage of the people that are just trying to put food on their table or gas in their tank. And, and you know, that is far and above who our, our vendor base, our artist base is. You know, whether whether we're doing the Native American art or, or selling anything else we have in the store, we really try to look at this kind of as a as three legged stool type of a an approach, you know, and, and every one of those legs is equally important. You know, you have the vendors and the artists who absolutely need to be they they need to to feel like they're being treated fair that they're getting a fair price and that we're supplying the materials for a lot of our artists that are quality materials out the gate and that at the end of the day when we purchase that art that they feel like this is a fair a fair compensation for what they're doing and then we have the customer base who is they they want the same thing they don't want to feel like they are being over overcharged for something and they want something that's going to end up being really a, a high quality piece and an heirloom piece. The the third leg of the stool is the company and our employees. We need to really feel like that we're compensating our our employees fairly, and that that if any one of those legs is short change, you know it's it's a wobbly foundation and it's no good. So, you know, it's a balancing act of all those things. I mean, so many of our Native artists, they hear the stories from how you can sell in Jackson Hole or, or Santa Fe or New York or, or Boston. And, and those, those kind of things just don't transfer to Main Street, South Dakota. It's just a different thing here. And I think our relationship that we have with our artists has been really long term. And, 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 that's, and that's been a wonderful thing. Uh, uh, my name is Kevin Fast Horse, and I'm affiliated with the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation. Oglala Sioux Tribe. I do a lot of uh, pre-reservation items in, uh, with the Lazy Stitch beadwork form. Use a lot of uh, the traditional hides of buffalo, elk, deer. Make a lot of uh, weaponry, shields, bags, a lot of ceremonial robes from, from buffalo to wolves, wolverines. Do a lot of uh, do a lot of work. <laughs> Everything I do is, is here. It, it comes and goes through here. We negotiate a contract every year of, of what items we need or, you know, I have creative freedom. They just ask me for like, let's say a couple of cradle boards, a wolf hide and some axes and knives and the rest is up to me. However, the size and color material I want to use. Well, I think every artist d- develops a style, and, and then it, it, once it's, you get going with it, it's recognizable. You know, I, it was hard to do that with my dad because we were similar for when I first started, and then I, I started doing my own thing, and, and people could tell now that who's dad's piece and Kev's piece. <laughs> my family, whole, most of my family are artists. Most of them are. My grandmother was really cool. She'd tell me how to make moccasins and my uncles taught me how to do a lot of the doll stuff and beadwork. But my dad went to the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and I studied under him for numerous years. And I swear I learned to do most of my, my work it was through him. I still go see him. He's still alive to this day. And, you know, we share material, ideas, you know. I, in fact, I was just there yesterday, getting him, getting him going on a pair of moccasins. He's getting up in age, though, but... He's up to the challenge. <laughs> yeah, I've been exclusive here for the past 24 years. I'm, I'm more like one of the family here. And, uh, they treat me good, treat each other really good. Good uh, relationship. I, I try to make it down once a week in the summertime and, and just visit with everybody. You know, 
talk about things. Well, I always do like four or five projects at a time because, you know, you can get bored. So, and otherwise you don't want to lose an idea. So you try to capture it and stay focused, you know, so I'm going to stay here and do this. So I can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. I'm addicted to it. It's, I do it every day. You can find me in my studio doing something every day. <laughs> you know, with so many people getting out of it, so many native people not passing on uh, those skills, the availability of really good quality Native American art is, it, it's getting harder and harder all the time to find that. So just that importance of, of passing those that on to the next generation is probably becoming more important. Well, it's, you know, as you know, it's, uh, you know, there's no one or very, very few people uh, in this business that are, are, their goals are not to become wealthy. Um, with the with the financial situation, especially on the reservation and the reservation communities, there is so much of a survival type thing. Um, you know, there are the, the upper end people that sell their artwork for thousands of dollars, and in some cases, tens of thousands of dollars. That is so not the normal person that we do business with. Our average person is really, really trying to find an outlet that they can sell to 12 months out of the year, not just during the tourist season when there's a lot of folks around and, and a lot of customers around. I've been working with Prairie Edge four years. Just started beating for them, and it, it's been 25 years. It's coming from where I came from to where I am today is just, it astonishes me because I didn't see it in my future. I didn't see it, you know, and I've been able to pass on the beading to my daughters. I have two daughters and they sometimes beat for Prairie Edge too. So it's something that as an artist, very lucky to have, to be here at Prairie Edge and the satisfying thing is when you see your artwork sell, it's like, somebody liked it. I must be doing something right. And I have people to thank for that, you know, people that were patient with me and taught me things, so. I think so because I grew up and where if you weren't in school, you were working. So I got my GED, I went on to cosmetology, I worked in a few beauty shops and it was, it was good, but I didn't feel like that's what I really wanted to do. So I came over here to South Dakota, and my neighbors were artists. And just talking and stuff, they got me started in beading, and that's how I started. I only bead for Prairie Edge, so it's uh, good to come down and see, um, walk in and see what you've done. And it's good to come in and see somebody buying or looking at your art piece or... Yeah, get called from the back room and so-and-so wants to take a picture with you. And I'm going, what? <laughs> so it's really, really good feeling to to begin it and then to see it sold, you know, and say somebody really liked it, you know. And majority of my artwork is geometric. And I do one of a kind. And my artwork, I age to make it look like it's back in the 1800s. And it takes... A few steps to make it look from like being brand new to make it look old. It takes quite a few steps and not everybody can do it. And I, I was taught how to do it. I don't see my beading and putting things together as a job. It's uh, really therapeutic for me. I, you can't tell it by looking at me. I have several di physical disabilities, so I can't go out and get a regular job lifting, pushing, shoving like that. So what I do, I can sit and I can bead. I can get up and walk around and... It's very therapeutic for me, and most of all, I enjoy it because I get done with one project, and it's like the next project is in my head, what design I want to do. And it's like starting something new, and everything that I do is one of a kind. And it's like I can't wait to get my next design going. I pick out my beads and get it going and say, yeah, I finished it, you know. So I'm going to be here for a while, as long as they let me.
Kevin Fast Horse's son. And, um, he taught me doing beadwork since I was 12 years old. Or that's when I started learning how to do beadwork and, and keeping the tradition alive from my grandpas and my grandma. And I still got a lot to learn though too, like beading, beading wise, getting some cradle boards and larger projects like that going. Eventually got serious with it when I was in middle school, 12 years old. I started out uh, beading. Uh, my interest kind of went, went from there, the artistic ways. And also, like the artistic values of beadwork kind of got me interested in music. While while I was beating, I'd listen to music all the time. And, you know, I just thought to myself, hey, it, it'd be cool to play that music, you know. So that's what I plan on my career being is, you know, an artist, either music-wise or Native American beadwork, which is, which is where my heart's at right now. That's what our family's known by is uh, our, our beadwork. My, my grandpa does have uh, his own thing that he does. It's, uh, you know, a fast first name. And then we, we also, you know, my dad beads exclusively here to beat Prairie Edge. And I've taken what I've learned from that and I make uh, necklaces for, you know, just friends and stuff, so. But I think we really have a good relationship and we continue to work with the tribes. Um, tribal tourism in South Dakota can only get bigger and better. Um, the infrastructure for a, for a lot of the reservation communities isn't where it, it, it needs to be yet as far as being open and inviting, but there, there's just a lot of people that work very, very hard at promoting tribal tourism in all of the reservations, and not just South Dakota, but, but all the Northern Plains. And I think that's gonna be an ongoing challenge. It's going to be an ongoing piece of work for all of us. Uh, because like you say, people are coming out here to the Great Plains, whether they're coming from Chicago or whether they're coming from Hamburg or Berlin or, or Tokyo. And in their mind, they have this, this picture. They still expect to see Native people on horses with feathers and, and that sort of thing. And it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. We have so many unbelievably important places here that will never show up on a on a tourist map um, but the spirituality of the northern plains and, and what people can take away from more than a, a statue of mount rushmore it's something that they can take away from the black hills and just all the northern plains in their heart you feel it it's what keeps pulling us back here and making us stay and call south dakota our home and the great plains our home and so many people come here not really knowing why they come to this part of the country uh, and they find something here that they take home and it, it's in their heart and, and they look at things a little bit differently after they smell some some sage burning or or something and that's that's probably the, the really important thing but I, our, we have a lot of work to do promoting all the tribal tourism spots and and you know the people Let's face it, it's a warm, it's a, just a warm, warm environment, an inviting environment for people to come wherever you're coming from. And, and there's a hump that we got to get over that says uh, reservations aren't safe. Um, you know, there's just all those, those, those things that, that we need to work on. Um, the, the tribes certainly work on them, but it's the people outside the reservation that, that encourage people to to go onto the reservations and meet the people and see what's there and and because it's just it's it's such an important part for us. I mean, if it weren't for the for our contact with obviously with Native Americans, we went we wouldn't be where we're at today without a doubt. You know, primarily our things are our our artwork here, our our native themed art. But we do have a tremendous amount of craft supplies, beads, books, and music. And so just about no matter where you come from in the world, or at least in the United States, if you have an interest in in tribes from anywhere around the United States, our books and music will, will probably will have a title that, that you'd be interested in. But, you know, really part of the mission of, of Prairie Edge is to give people an opportunity to educate themselves. You know, we can start that process. People come in and they'll see artwork from different tribes and they'll, why my grandma, I think she might have been, she might have been Chippewa or she may have been Omaha or, or, or you know, I think that, that somewhere our families are Lakota. And they'll look around and see something, and maybe their first step is to go pick up a book and and to start to read a little bit about it. And then, you know, the educational process that's that's always what it's going to be about. Sometimes it is has a lot more to do with listening 
than it is taking the lead. And, you know, so many people are drawn to the native culture because of the calm. You know, this is the only earth we have. If you're not nervous about what's going on, you, you need to start paying a little bit closer attention. We literally, I mean, the, the, the folks of South Dakota, whether they're reservation or non-reservation, folks are experiencing literally biblical flooding almost. And, you know, just the changes in everything that's going on. And I guess just that is where we get some of our solace from is looking back towards the earth and and trying to pay attention to what's going on and you know just those little things the smell of sage burning and and just having the opportunity to talk to some folks that are truly grounded and you know not pursuing everything isn't about the dollars you know we have this earth that we got to protect and we're all inhabitants of it at what point in time do we start being kind, you know, and, and start to respect what what other people's beliefs are? I certainly don't need to to share Native religion, but I certainly find real solace in that. Again, no one is saying, you know, that you have to adopt this culture as your own culture, but it's a wonderful experience to listen to people and, and draw out of that the, the really good things. And, and you know, I, I believe everybody can benefit a little bit from that slowing down a little bit and just that respect for whatever culture you're, you're examining. And Prairie Edge is the premier venue for the art of the Lakota and one of the finest Native American art galleries in the world. Their mission is right on track, and I commend Rita and Ray Hillenbrand and Dan Tribby for their dedication to the American Indian culture. They have enriched the lives of not only Native American artists, but the many thousands of people who visit every year in search of their own American Indian connection. If traveling through South Dakota or planning a visit to the Black Hills, be sure to put Prairie Edge on your list of must-see locations. You can visit their website at www.prairieedge.com or call their toll-free number at 1-800-541-2388. While I was interviewing Dan, I asked him how he would like to conclude the Prairie Edge story. He said the winters are long and hard here in the Northern Plains, and every winter we come across some of the reservation folks, especially the elders, that suffer greatly simply because they cannot heat their homes. Propane many times is in short supply, and some folks just can't afford to refill their tanks. It was then that Dan mentioned the wonderful work of an organization called Running Strong. Running Strong provides utility assistance to American Indian families to help them meet their heating and electricity needs by providing funds to help families purchase propane, electricity, firewood, and gas. Every year, they help hundreds of Native American families heat their homes during sub-zero winters on the plains. In conclusion to our story, all of us here at Hidden Heritage and Prairie Edge would like to ask you, our loyal viewers, to consider making a donation or contribution of any size to the Running Strong organization. You can contact them at their website, www.indianyouth.org. Oh, 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 yeah.